Hello everyone, my name is Connor Jones, and welcome to Decades. If you aren't familiar with me yet, that's because the last time I presented a video, this channel was half the size it is now, and these past few months I've had the pleasure of sailing around the world, visiting some spectacular scenes such as the Rocky of Gibraltar, this American flag in America, and of course, today's video, the Suez Canal. An 120 mile long artificial sea level waterway passing through Egypt, linking the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, splitting the continents of Africa and Asia. In today's video, we're going to explore this canal's history, the history that came before the canal, and of course, the occasional B-roll shot of a passing train. So grab yourselves a brew and a biscuit, and let's set sail. The truth is, the Suez Canal really only accounts for the tail end of a very long history, one that began millennia ago in one of the most fascinating ancient civilizations. That, my friends, means two things. Firstly, I'm going to be pronouncing an awful lot of things the English way, meaning incorrectly. Second thing, is that I'm royally out of my depth. The pun felt adequate, considering I'm on a ship. For pre-context, human civilizations have traded for thousands and thousands of years. No matter how old the civilization was, or how advanced and recent it is, to thrive it required, or requires, an economy. Ancient Egypt was no different. For as long as trade has existed, there have been people finding means to expedite the cycle, increasing the pace and intensity of the economy through travelling between one place and another faster, safer and as reliably as possible. One such event would be the canal. Also, for good agricultural benefits, such as the irrigation and otherwise manipulation of the land to have water where you need it. Evidence of ancient Egyptian canals would be discovered by Napoleon Bonaparte, or at least somebody he was in command of, during his campaign in Egypt in the closing years of the 18th century. The ancient canal of the pharaohs is believed to be something of a precursor to the modern Suez Canal. Research suggests this canal was planned as far back as the second millennium BCE during ancient Egyptians 12th dynasty and finally completed over a thousand years later under the Persian rule of Darius the Great and then intermittently utilized until the 8th century CE. That being said, this is subject of some conjecture. Although Darius the Great's Suez inscriptions and Herodotus both claim the canal opened under Darius. Many other authors would claim that the canal was not completed at this time. A secondary theory is that the ancient canal was constructed under the rule of Ptolemy II. It followed a different course to the modern Suez Canal. Instead of connecting the Mediterranean to the Red Sea directly, it connected the Red Sea to the River Nile. Over the centuries, however, the Red Sea is believed to have receded gradually, pushing its coastline south. This likely led to the discontinuation of Ptolemy's Canal. By the 8th century, a canal existed between Cairo and the Red Sea, linked via the Nile, of course ending nearby to the modern day Suez. It's believed that particular canal was closed in the year 767. Over the centuries that followed, the world's economic interests would naturally grow as they always do, with trade values exponentially increasing 
in short time frames. With European interests in trade to and from the Indian Ocean, leading to a demand for a means to bypass long detours or resorting to tighter, less predictable waterways. In the late 15th century, Bartolomeu Dias, a Portuguese mariner, would direct trade routes to India and the Spice Islands, known today as the Maluku Islands. This caused a massive paradigm shift within the Mediterranean trade, toppling the hub of the spice trade, Venice. In desperation to bring luxury trade to Venice once more, the Venetians conceptualized an idea for a waterway to be dug between the Red Sea and the River Nile. This plan never came to fruition. The Ottoman Empire would also have a crack at constructing a canal running from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean during the 16th century. The Ottomans desired to draw a connection between Constantinople, known today as Istanbul, to the trade routes in the Indian Ocean. A notion bolstered by strategic advantages to be gained, especially with tensions between the Ottomans and the Portuguese Empire that ran from the early 16th century to the 18th century. A less than ideal situation considering the Portuguese Empire's proximity to the Strait of Gibraltar. A canal would have allowed for the Ottomans to link their Red Sea, Black Sea and Mediterranean fleets, though unfortunately for them, the project was considered to be far too expensive. Following Napoleon's discovery of the ancient man-made waterways in the very late 18th century, he would consider constructing a north-south canal connecting the Mediterranean with the Red Sea. The plan would be forsaken when the French concluded that the waterway would be incredibly costly, not to mention time-consuming due to the misplaced belief that such a waterway would require locks to function. This was because of a miscalculation concluding that the Red Sea was 30 feet higher than the Mediterranean. In the 19th century, the concern regarding the supposed difference in sea levels did not kill off the concept of a shorter route to the east. General Francis Chesney, a British general and explorer, would submit a report to the British government in 1830. This report suggests that there was no sea level difference to speak of. This meant the construction of a canal was doable. That being said, his report did not cause immediate action. A few years later, in 1833, French explorer Léon de Bellefond would become chief engineer of the Egyptian Department of Public Works. One duty undertaken by him would be to survey the isthmus of the Suez, once again concluding that the Mediterranean and the Red Sea bore no difference in elevation and drawing up plans for a canal this drew the interests of others worldwide. In 1846, a number of experts would be invited to report on the feasibility of a prospective canal. Britain would be cautious, fearing a canal open to everyone had a chance of interfering with its already established trade with India, preferring a connection by train from Alexandria to Suez via Cairo. The decade that followed, a French diplomat Ferdinand de Lesser would obtain a concession from the Khedive of Egypt and Sudan, Said Pasha. This concession was to form a company that could construct a canal open to all nations with rights to operate the canal for 99 years following its opening. Once again, the idea of a Suez Canal would go to the drawing board, with detailed plans being drafted by December of 1856. This plan included a description of the canal complete with all necessary profiles. That same month, the Suez Canal Company would be born. Meanwhile, the British government still opposed to the project, as put by Prime Minister Henry John Temple, 3rd Viscount of Palmerston, also known as Lord Palmerston. Britain's commercial and maritime relations were at risk of being overthrown by the establishment of a new trade route. Britain did more than just talk about it, they actively attempted to halt and slow the project one way or another from the offset. I imagine the conversation went a little like this. 
Please don't build the canal. Watch me at. Now, with our immaturity out the way, for now, it's time to discuss where the canal actually became more than just ideas. Work would begin on the shore of what we know today as Port Said on April of 1859. The excavation of the canal took approximately a decade, with forced labour being employed until 1864 when Britain opposed it as a diplomatic effort to halt the project. It is unclear if France responded with more baguette bludgeoning. However, forced labour on the project would cease. It is believed over the course of the construction of the canal, some 1.5 million people worked on it, with 30,000 actively working on it at any given period. These people hailed from different countries and tens of thousands of labourers died from diseases like cholera. The exact number is however disputed with wild margins with estimates as low as a thousand deaths and as high as 120,000. This would make it one of the deadliest construction projects in history. Regardless, the Suez Canal would see completion and be opened in 1869, supplemented by the Suez Canal Company, towns along the canal constructed from this point into the decades that followed, such as Port Said and Port Fode. At the canal's Mediterranean entrance, there was also Ismailia, near the middle of the route, and Port Twifek, which sat at the canal's southern entrance on the Red Sea. Upon the completion, the Suez Canal was 100 miles in length from one end to the other. The canal would be opened under French control in November of 1869, with ceremonies held at Port Said, complete with fireworks and a banquet on the yacht of Khedib Ismail Pasha on the 15th of that month. The following day, French Empress Eugene and Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph I, along with Frederick III, the Crown Prince of Prussia, and Prince Louis of Hesse would arrive. Other international guests would also show face on the afternoon of the 16th of November, 1869. The canal would be blessed with both Christian and Muslim ceremonies, and the festivities continued. A procession of ships would enter the canal on the 17th of November, headed by the French imperial yacht of Eugène de Legal, and amongst the number of ships following sat HMS Newport, captain by Vice Admiral Sir George Strongnares. The Newport, would become involved in an incident while surveying the canal on behalf of the United Kingdom's Admiralty, highlighting some of the problems with the canal. The deepest part of the canal was not made clear, causing a concern for grounding. This is an event that did occur on occasion. The French vessel Pelouse would also be one such ship that would become grounded on the canal in its opening days. In the aftermath of this grand opening, the canal did experience some difficulties. For the first two years, traffic passing through the canal was lower than anticipated. That being said, remaining works on the canal would only be completed for 1871. Ferdinand de Lessup would attempt to increase revenues for the canal by interpreting the net ton, meaning a ship's cargo capacity rather than a theoretical net tonnage of the Mawson system. The Mawson system was a method created in the United Kingdom for calculating the cargo capacity of sailing ships for assessing harbour and other vessel fees. It will become British law in 1854. This allowed the establishment of clear tariffs resulting in the Suez Canal net tonnage and special tonnage certificate, practices still in operation today. The canal's impact on world trade was almost instant, considering the American Transcontinental Railroad was completed only six months before the canal's completion. 
the world could now be circumnavigated in record times. You know what I see when I look out there? I see the 21st century. That's what I see. But right here, 1855. It also played a part in the role of European colonization of Africa. The canal's existence also contributed to the Panic of 1873, a financial crisis that triggered an economic depression in both Europe and North America, originally known as the Great Depression. Until the Americans reminded the world they always do things bigger and better with the Great Depression of the 1930s. This is because until this point, goods from the Far East had to be carried aboard sailing vessels around the Cape of Good Hope the southernmost tip of Africa, stored in British warehouses. In 1875, Khedivis Malapasha would sell his 44% share in the canal for £4 million to pay off his bank debts to the government of the UK. Despite this, the French shareholders would still hold the majority. Local unrest, however, would cause the British to invade in 1882 assuming full control. Egypt remained part of the Ottoman Empire, but the government would be recognised and modernised, suppressing rebellions and supposedly corruption. As a result, traffic on the Suez Canal would increase. Those who posed to gain the most from the benefits of the Suez Canal would be Mediterranean nations of Europe, particularly Austria-Hungary. In October of 1888, the signing of the Convention of Constantinople would declare the Suez Canal a neutral zone under the protection of the British Empire, which granted them effective control. But the treaty was interpreted as the guaranteed right of passage for all ships through the Suez Canal during wartime and peacetime. The British would be forced to defend the Suez Canal in 1915 when the Ottoman Empire, aided by officers from the German Empire, attempted a raid on the significant trade route as a chapter in the bloody conflict that was the First World War. Ottoman forces crossed the Sinai Peninsula, but their attack failed despite their impressive number due to the robust defences in place. With the outbreak of World War II, the canal once again held strategic significance. Italian and German forces attempted to capture it numerous times, though they were unsuccessful. As a result, the canal remained close to Axis shipping. Following the conclusion of the Second World War, Egypt would reject their 1936 treaty with Great Britain by 1951. The UK agreed to withdraw troops from the canal zone in 1954. The UK and US also withdrew their pledge to financially support the construction of the Aswan Dam across the Nile in Aswan, Egypt. In case you didn't know, you know, Aswan, Aswan. This was because of Egyptian negotiations with the Soviet Union. As a result of this, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nazir nationalized the canal in July of 1956, transferring control to the Suez Canal Authority. The Straits of Tehran would also be closed to all Israeli vessels, leading to the Suez Crisis, resulting in the UK, France and Israel invading Egypt. The Israeli forces engaged on the Egyptians on the Sinai Peninsula, allowing Britain and France to declare the fighting a threat to stability in the Middle East. Entering the war, with the smokescreen purpose of splitting the two forces apart and restoring peace. However, the true motive was likely to regain control over the Suez Canal. Canada's Secretary of State for External Affairs, a man named Lester B. Pearson, proposed the formation of the first United Nations peacekeeping force to ensure all had access to the canal which gained the majority vote on the 4th of November 1956, mandating UN peacekeepers to remain in the Sinai unless both Egypt and Israel agreed to withdrawal. The canal would remain closed until April of 1957, 
due to the damage and sunken ships, but those will be cleared away with the aid of the United Nations. Around a decade later, in May of 1967, Egypt would order UNEF peacekeeping forces out of the Sinai Peninsula, sending Egyptian soldiers to assume their positions. The subject of concern, once again, was Israel from an Egyptian perspective. Nasir would order the Straits of Tehran to be closed to Israeli trade, restricting Israel's shipping between Iliad and the Red Sea. Following this month, the Six-Day War would break out, resulting in Egypt immediately imposing a blockade of the canal, closing it to all shipping. This blockade was unanticipated, meaning a fleet of some 15 cargo vessels that became known as the Yellow Fleet became trapped in the block canal along with their crews and will remain there until the blockade ended some eight years later. The canal would remain stuffed for some time. Israeli forces would occupy the Sinai Peninsula, compromising the east bank of the Suez Canal. Over the next two years, tensions between Egypt and Israel would rise, resulting in a war of attrition, best described as a long game tactic in conflicts, which the opposition is worn down over time rather than outright invaded. Gamir Abdel Nazir, the Egyptian president, would attempt to retake territories occupied by Israel. The conflict would subside with Nazir's passing in 1970. Although tensions would persist, but the distribution of territory remained the same. In October of 1973, the canal would become the site of Operation Badr. And no, it's not a Scottish thing where they batter things. <laughs> <laughs> an Egyptian military operation to cross the Suez Canal into Israeli-occupied Sinai Peninsula as part of the Yom Kippur War. Along with the canal's edges, even today, you can still see the wreckage of this conflict. Following the Yom Kippur War, Western interests turned to clearing the canal and resuming trade. Enter the United States with Operation Nimbus Moon. Where do they come up with these names? Do you reckon they just like decapitate a chicken, let it run around a ball with silly names and wherever it dies, that's the name they choose? Probably. <laughs> anyway, Operation Nimbus Moon entailed the amphibious assault ship USS Icon being sent to the canal containing 12 RH-53D minesweeping helicopters in an attempt to clear the canal between May and December of 1974. The British Royal Navy would also embark on operations to clear the canal of mines. The canal would be reopened in 1975 by Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. A few short years later, in 1979, the UNEF mandate would expire. Nations such as US, Israel and Egypt, among others, would attempt to obtain an extension of the United Nations role in ensuring peace between Israel and Egypt but the mandate was unable to be extended due to being vetoed by the USSR. This would give rise to the Multinational Force and Observers of MFO, for short, in the early 1980s who would assume the role of overseeing the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, initially stationed in the Sinai Peninsula in 1981. The MFO remains active to this day. The Suez Canal's history will go quiet presumably with trade doing what trade does in the decades that followed. The Bala Bypass will be expanded in width from roughly 60 metres to 300 metres in 2014, allowing ships to traverse the canal in both directions simultaneously, at a cost of only 9 billion US dollars. Chump change. And that's it really for the Suez Canal. Ships travel down it each way until 2021, when some clamp it blocked it. Oh yes, viewers, we're not finished. I had you there for a second. At 5.40 a.m. GMT, or 7.40 a.m. local time, on the 23rd of March, the canal became blocked in both directions by the Evergreen class container, the Ever Given. The vessel had run aground after strong winds allegedly blew the ship off course. This turned the ship sideways and completely obstructed the Suez Canal. This is the event that gave pause to world trade and made the world realise 
just how imperative the Suez Canal is, with the international chain bearer shipping estimating that up to 3 billion US dollars worth of cargo passes through these waters every single day. The Ever Given would be freed on the 29th of March, after 6 days of being the world's most expensive meme, and a few hours later the cargo traffic in the Suez Canal would resume. Today, the Suez Canal is one of the world's most heavily utilised shipping lanes, providing the shortest maritime route between Europe and the Indian Ocean, saving fuel costs, and most importantly, time for goods to circle the Earth. Its impact on the world's economy is vital. So, you're probably wondering, what is the Suez Canal actually like? Well, take it from me, I've sailed through there. Twice. I'm not going to pretend that it's my most favourite place on the planet, but nonetheless it's still an impressive feat of engineering. And if travelling to strange and obscure parts of the world to see big ships is your thing, then I could see someone like that thoroughly enjoying it. This brings us nicely to the end of today's video. I am back, and I feel that that within itself is worth of a round of applause. So I'll pause for a second for you to clap. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. If you've got a friend that you'd be interested to show decades, but they keep coming up with menial excuses not to watch our content, whether it be, I'll do it when I have some time or it's not really my thing, simply strap them to a raft, put them behind the dirtiest container ship you can find and let it skew itself across the Suez Canal. So all they have to do for six days is watch our stuff on repeat. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, goodbye.